This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. Our guest this week is Ursula Harris, who has some stories to tell us about uh, her CPS involvement. Uh, Ursula, just to start out, could you tell us a little bit about the background of your case? Well, um, initially, we moved to Ohio, or moved from Ohio to Michigan, and um, had called and asked for some help for my daughter. She had some um, issues with postpartum after she had her children, and they came out on two separate occasions and decided that there was really nothing they could do uh, to help us or no services to offer my daughter. Um, and um, so we kind of thought it was over at that point. And then she had a CMH worker that came to our home and the CMH worker had witnessed an argument between my daughter and her boyfriend. And in that argument, my daughter, you know, raised her voice and lost her temper and cursed and ran out, you know, the door after him and um, leaving the children at home with myself. I was, I was at home and, um, she came back in maybe about 10, 15 minutes later, but um, by that time the CMH worker had left and the next day we had um, a CPS worker at our door. Um, uh, for our viewers and stuff, can you tell us what CMH stands for? Uh, CMH is Community Mental Health and that's in Muskegon, Michigan. And it's supposed to help uh, citizens uh, in Muskegon County with uh, mental health issues or developmental issues. Uh, they provide services, counseling, uh, uh, psychologist and psychiatrist uh, assistance. Okay, can you tell us about what year this was and how old the, the children were at this time? Well, this actually happened this past summer. So this uh, July, 2012. Um, I have two, I had two grandchildren at the time. Um, Milani was two at the time and Riley was one. Okay, so and what was your experience uh, uh, at that time? Uh, what were your thoughts and then what happened next? Well, at that time when they came to do the investigation, um, you know, they, I, I worked with them. I tried to, because I thought that it was the best thing for Gabrielle. Um, as she did have some, some emotional problems, I thought that maybe she needed uh, to be medicated as she had several um, uh, issues with um, bipolar, she has developmental delay, some mood disorders. Um, and, you know, we just thought that it was best, especially since having given birth, um, that she had postpartum, that it was another additive to her our psychosis. And we felt it best that while they were investigating that, you know, that they understand that, you know, we've been seeking help, we've been reaching out, we've, we've um, asked all um, the agencies in the area for help and, you know, it, it kind, of, uh, kind of bit us in the end. Um, now, so far, um, my understanding was that some of your case took place in Ohio also? Well, in Ohio, um, when, when I first moved to Ohio, I kind of have to go back a little bit. Back in 1993, um, I had just uh, finished college and moved back to Muskegon from New Hampshire and just couldn't find a job. So um, I had a relative that lived in Columbus, Ohio, and, and she, you know, had also graduated from college and got, a, got a, an employment um, almost immediately um, upon going to Columbus, Ohio. So I thought I would give that a try. And I asked my mother if she would keep my daughter for a period of time for me to get a, a job and get housing. 
and um, she made me sign all this extensive paperwork. My mother was a CPS worker at the time for uh, Ottawa County. And um, after about 30 days, I, had, I, I secured employment immediately once I moved to Columbus, Ohio. I just hadn't um, established a place of residence. I was, I was needing to save up enough money to get a deposit in the first month. Um, and I had a conversation with my mother telling her if I could have another 30 days that I would have everything all set up, we'd be able to, I would have already moved in. Um, and my mother wasn't very happy with it, but she didn't decline, you know, to extend that, uh, my daughter's stay. Um, within a week, I was served with papers in Ohio um, uh, alleging abandonment. Okay, so then it sounds like this case really started back then, probably. Uh, I, I believe, it, I believe my, my first kind of um, initiation with CPS started back then, sure. Oh, okay. Um, and so how did, uh, can you explain how, it, um, you know, your experience with CPS back then uh, ended up turning into this case more recently this past summer? Well, I don't, I don't know that they kind of, I, I think they inadvertently kind of tie back to each other. Um, but at the time when my mother filed uh, the CPS case, um, you know, it was, it was just as difficult to navigate within the system back then. Uh, I think the difference now is that I'm, I'm older, I'm wiser, um, and back then I really didn't know what my rights were, although I won. I was able to win in navigating through that system by myself. Um, I just think that back then it was, it was more so they, they couldn't really prove anything. Um, it, it, was, it was a different case. It was my mother. So that the, understand the undertone was a little bit different and that, um, you know, her reasons for doing it, I'm not so sure were the best reasons because it wasn't that she, you know, filed these allegations because she wanted my daughter. Um, because once she filed those allegations, she removed my daughter from her own care and placed my daughter in foster care. Now, and so you had that experience, you know, from your younger days with your own children. And sure. Now, uh, more recently, it's been with your grandchildren. It has, yes. And, and with your daughter. Um, so. What, what was the, can you explain why, now did CPS come in and remove your grandchildren? Not, not immediately. Uh, when CPS came in, um, I made them aware that we had prior involvement and, um, you know, I, I let them know what the situation was previously and that, you know, at this point we just, you know, we've been reaching out. We, we wanted to get some assistance uh, for my daughter and I was willing to cooperate. And so um, they went in and, and petitioned the court to have the children remain in my care. Uh, the judge ordered that. And in this time span, the worker and my daughter, um, as the worker would come to the house, they, they didn't get along. Um, they had arguments. Uh, my daughter um, you know, would curse her because you know, the, the worker kind of treated my daughter like she was mentally handica handicapped. Um, she talked to her in a way that was degrading. And so my daughter was not, you know, she just wasn't buying that. She, she barked back. And um, it, once she said a few things to my daughter that I didn't think were appropriate, then I kind of took the, I took the reins and uh, told her that I, you know, it was not acceptable. She could not talk to my, my child, no matter what deficiencies Gabby had. Um, I didn't feel that it was right for her to treat her in that manner and, and that she was my child. I wasn't going to let her do that. Um, at that point, she had said that she would have a court order the next morning. If Gabby continued, she'd have a court order the next morning to remove the children. And I told her, no, you're not going to do that. You can't do that. Just because you don't get along with my daughter, you can't do that. But she did. So, okay, so that's, uh, so, uh, then I suppose that's somehow tied into the reasoning why they decided to uh, take the children into custody? Um, I think that was, I think it was more of a personality issue. I think it was more um, just an abuse of, 
a power. I saw it as, you know, her threatening, if you continue to do this, I'm going to have them removed. Certainly, if I call you a name or call you uh, something out of line, that does not you know, give you or garner you the right to remove children. Um, you remove children for allegations of abuse or neglect. You don't remove them because you and I have a, a personality conflict, and that's what she did. Um, for context, then, what was the approximate date when this happened, when they took the children? Um, July, I believe it was July 27th, 2012. Okay, and, and was there an agency or uh, also involved with this? Uh, well, CMH, the Community Mental Health, um, that worker was at the home. She's the one who filed the complaint. And we never really, we've never really seen what the complaint was, even to, the, to, to this day. Um, they said they, they were not entitled to show me anything. Um, and my daughter couldn't tell me what they should, they never give her anything in writing. They show it to her and then they, you know, even her attorney shows it to her and then it goes back in the file. They don't make copies for her, her own records. They don't feel that she can cognitively understand, um, you know, what's in those letters. But I will tell you, um, my daughter is a very high functioning. She does have some developmental delays, more cognitively. Um, uh, delayed than anything. Um, she graduated high school, mainstreamed. Um, she went off to culinary arts school, so she's not challenged to that degree. Um, she's very, very high functioning. Um, she, I think more socially, we, we have some delays, but she's very bright. And now, uh, so they, they took the children in July, mm -hmm. and, and then um, and did, did you eventually get the children back? Then? I did. The, ne the very next court hearing, because um, I'll tell you that them taking the children was a huge production. Um, it was the worker bringing the Fruitport police to the house. It was um, her, you know, in order for her to get that um, uh, accompaniment from the police, she indicated she had a court order. Um, I was not at home, but my son and my daughter's boyfriend were there and they had called me. Everybody was in hysterics saying that uh, they were there to remove the children. They had a court order and if I didn't bring them back that I would be charged with kidnapping. Um, and so the next morning I brought the children into DHS and um, you know, it was a very difficult situation to just turn over your children and um, we weren't able to have a say in it until the next hearing. And at that hearing, it was discovered that there was no court order to remove them from my home. Um, we discovered that, you know, the judge was extremely upset. And, and we're not talking about Judge Pittman, we're talking about the referee that you have before the case gets adjudicated. Um, and that refu refu uh, referee had indicated that, you know, um, you remove children outside of my order. You know, they never do that again. You can never do that again. I don't know that they did anything about it. Um, nobody ever issued an apology. I wrote and filed complaints, grievances, all the way up to the office of the ombudsman, um, up to the family advocate. I wrote directly to Maureen Corrigan's office, um, and of which they replied that they, re they were in receipt of my concerns and that they would investigate. I requested a foster care review. Um, they turned me down for the foster care review. Um, they felt that they don't really deal with those issues, which is the same thing the office of the ombudsman said was we don't really deal with personnel issues or, you know, if a if a worker you know um, stepped out of line of their responsibilities or their duties, that's really nothing nothing so severe that we need to get involved. But really, you know, the workers are the ones that are making these allegations. The workers are the ones who are removing the children. They're the ones who are um, supposed to be following the court order. And so if you're not going to hold them account, if you're not going to hold them accountable for the things that they do, then, you know, it's kind of you allow them to do what they want to do. So they were telling you when they were taking the children that they were going to charge you with kidnapping because they had a court order, mm -hmm. but when they find out that they don't have a uh, court order to do this, essentially, I would think they should be charged with kidnapping. Uh, so well, that's, court order. that's another case. <laughs> that's something that we're going to pursue down the road. Um, now, now, how old is your granddaughter? She's now three and a half. 
Uh, how, can you can you, you know, briefly explain how traumatic this might have been for her and how long she was actually gone? Well, my, my granddaughter, Milani, and my grandson, Riley, were removed. Um, it, they, they had to be um, peeled off my leg. Um, they were very upset, and um, it was just a horrible day to remember. Um, I think... Um, when she was returned, it took her probably uh, probably about a day to even talk to me. Um, she never mentioned who the people were that she stayed with or anything that happened in that home. Um, she just, even to the, I mean, she just never spoke of it. She just never wanted to talk about it. She just got real quiet about it. Um, and I, I don't really know, I mean, her behavior was a, a you know, little different when she came back, a little difficult. She wasn't really listening, um, um, didn't follow rules very well, and just was, you know, almost like everything that she was taught before, you know, you had to reteach her. And how many days were they gone? Actually? For about a week and a half. It was a little bit less than two weeks. And we had to re-potty train her. She re regressed completely. Um, you know, it was just starting all over. And um, this, during this week and a half, did you have any contact with her? Or not at all. They would not let me talk to her on the phone. They would not let me see her. There was no contact whatsoever. Was there any reason given for that, why you couldn't even no. talk with them under supervised visitation or something? No. Nope. Could anybody else in your family go talk to them? Nobody was allowed to talk to them while they were gone. This was through Holy Cross here in Grand, in Grand Rapids. Um, they refused to allow us to know where she was. Uh, we just wanted to know if they were safe. Um, so for a week and a half, they were essentially kidnapped with no authorization, and it was this was done under uh, uh, by the police. They had guns, I suppose, right? Um, I would imagine they did, but I was not there. My son was there. He was very traumatized by it. Um, he was screaming, you know, Mom, just give them the kids. Please just give them the kids. I don't want you to go to jail. And, you know, it was just, it was a horrible night. It was not anything that I, I even... Now, um, I, this seems just incredibly traumatic, not, not only for the kids, but uh, also for the rest of the family. I mean, what a disruption. I'm sure it had an effect on everybody's, uh, you know, jobs. I mean, how, how can you go back to work the next day when your grandkids, children, your children are taken? It, I mean... They were actually taken um, the Friday before I was supposed to start my new job at Spectrum Health. Yeah, and I don't think we have time in this show to go into that, but I think most people can imagine just how traumatic that would just that would be. Just Sure. There, there can't hardly be a more, you know you know, a case where it would just upset somebody where they think they can just go right back to work as if nothing happened. Sure. Now, um, just to be clear here, and because I, I find this so hard to believe, you, you contacted the court and the, uh, the, the agencies, and uh, did you even contact the police department? Is, and nobody's getting in any kind of reprimand for this behavior? Um, w with DHS, I sat down with Bruce Wright, um, who is, I believe, a director down at, uh, for CPS. Um, met with him, gave him um, a 12-page complaint, and um, then met with Jane Johnson, who is the, I believe, the director or executive director over the Muskegon County DHS. And uh, she had asked me back in August if I could give her till the first week in September to respond to all of my allegations. Um, and if in fact those things happened, she would address them and make corrections and would address the corrections made in that letter. She's never returned a phone call. I've never heard from her since. I've sent an email every week for about two months um, to her none were replied. I spoke to her assistant who would always apologize for Miss Johnson not returning my call but you know just told me to c continue to email her and until she responded and she never did. Uh, that's just just amazing and, um, and we'd like to go on too because it's such a short show we've got to cover so many so much material mm -hmm. you know briefly 
Uh, another issue that we've seen a lot of um, uh, people complain about is this thing called the central registry. Sure. Where people can get put on the central registry, it's almost like a secret blacklist for parents and they can be put on it without any kind of due process and no kind of trial, no kind of hearing. Um, and I understand that you've had some experience with this too. I mean, we only have a few minutes left, but can you can you explain your story on the sure. central registry? Well, when my mother, um, you know, filed for abandonment charges uh, back in 93, um, I wasn't aware of a central registry. Um, and so apparently my name was there. However, when they first did their investigation uh, present day um, for the situation with my daughter, I was not on the central registry. They, they could not locate me on the central registry. Um, once I started filing complaints, they came back with, you know, the reason we're not in support of the children being with you is because you're on the central registry. And my response was, but you placed her there. You, you ran my background. You, you came back and said, we don't find you on the central registry. So, you know, that's why you allowed the courts to place the children in my care. Once I filed my grievance, all of a sudden I'm on the central registry again. And um, now you cannot be in support of the children being with me, no matter if they were raised, they were born and raised in my care from birth. Um, and I was, I thought that there were some stipulations that would prevent you from still being on the list. And one being anything prior to 1995, um, that there was an automatic removal um, due to the due process and the non, you know, if you weren't served and notified that you were gonna be on this registry, then you would be removed. I qualified there. They also indicated that um, you could be removed if the child turned, eight, turned 18. Um, my daughter is 23. Um, and then they also said, you know, if the event occurred more than 10 years, 10 years or more, then you could be removed. All of this has occurred, you know, 20 plus years, and I'm still there. I requested removal in writing, and I got a denial for that, um, stating that uh, the reason was too severe. They found that I abandoned my daughter, therefore I did not provide stable housing for her, which means they are still in agreement for me being on that registry. Um, yeah, th I, we hear about these stories about the central registry uh, repeatedly, and I think most people don't understand just how uh, people can be put on this list that can affect their parental rights so profoundly, and it's really just, um, just uh, a, a employee at the at DHS or one of the organizations can put you secretly, put uh, someone's name on this list, and they don't even know that they're on the list. Well, my concern is, how did I get back on the list? Or how did I get on the list? Because apparently I wasn't on there before. So now that you know, I brought it to their attention and maybe they were able to uh, find the file, but um, you know, I was back on the list after I filed my complaints. And not currently, are you still on the list? I am still on the list. Uh, they refused to remove me. He said I could request an administrative review hearing. And um, he said that it, w he said I could challenge it and it would come back to him. And then he would look at my challenge and decide whether or not to accept or reject it. And then at that point, I could ask for an administrative review hearing. Okay, and now a few loose ends here too. You talked about the referee reprimanded reprimanded the CPS workers correct sternly which doesn't seem like much of a penalty for kidnapping no two children for a week and a half uh, did you ever get in front of the actual judge in that case I did I'm in front of Judge Pittman now um, but because it's my daughter's case they have all kind of um, they've silenced me they feel that they don't need to they don't owe me any explanation they feel that um, they, you know, they direct their comments or concerns to my daughter um, and they don't have to address me. So I don't get to speak to Judge Pittman about any of my concerns. All I do is continue to file my complaints and uh, post on Facebook. They've, take, they've taken all my Facebook postings and brought it to court. Um, they've taken the Michigan for Parental Rights postings that I have and brought them to court uh, and, and tried to use them as kind of a ploy, almost like an intimidation thing. Like, you know, we're watching you, we see what you're doing. And the judge just indicated to me that um, he could not take away my constitutional right and tell me not to do it, but that it wasn't in my best interest to pursue doing it.
continuing on with it. Um, I could see, understand how, since you're actually not a party to the case, you're the parent. What about your daughter? Has she got any, um, had any uh, good experience with the judge? Um, no, nobody really lets her talk. Um, her attorneys come in um, at the last hearing we were at last week. Um, they were all there for an hour, and the judge was getting ready to come into the courtroom before her attorney even spoke to her. Um, because from, from what I'm hearing, I would think the judge would also want to reprimand CPS in a case like this, but that hasn't happened in this case yet? Well, CPS is not involved by the time we get to the uh, adjudication. You have the foster care agency. And what um, has happened with the foster care agency, which is Bethany Christian Services, is um, when we go in, there's a court report, and that court report has a whole bunch of fallacies. Um, you know, they'll say things like she's not bringing them to their doctor's appointments. And then, you know, I, I've had to argue and say, yes, I do. I've taken them this time, this time, this time. And then the judge will say, is that true? And, and then the worker will say, well, I, 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 I'm not sure. Well, why would you even put something in a report as though it were fact if you didn't even yourself try to follow up? Um, and just briefly then, how did Bethany Christian Services get involved with the case? Um, because the twins were born in October and we had laid out, um, we had guardianship paperwork and everything for the twins. Um, and we served that to DHS and they came in about an hour and a half after my daughter gave birth with their removal, which prevented the rest of the family from seeing the twins at that point. We couldn't, they were in the NICU. We weren't allowed to visit them in the NICU. We weren't allowed to see them after that. Um, since we only have about 30 seconds, do you have any idea why uh, these agencies are doing that kind of thing? Um, I'm, I'm confident that, you know, anytime you want to um, do a third party with an agency that is, that is funded by adoption, um, most of their money comes from adoption dollars, um, and the state also gets stipends. I think that's really what motivates them anymore. Okay. I want to thank you for watching the program tonight. You can tune in next week at the same time and view another edition of Silent Voices. I want to remind everybody that we have Citizens for Parental Rights meetings right here at the studio at WKTV, 5261 Clyde Park Avenue, right here in Wyoming, Michigan. That's every third Monday from 7 to 9 p.m. Hope you can come out and join us. I also, if... Uh, you like to join a social network, you can join our network at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. If you'd like to be a guest on this program or send us an email with some comments, you can send that to us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrightsgmail.com. Once again, thank you for watching the program, and remember until next time, your voice can make the difference.